War Room, Gwinnett County, the people's voice, keeping you informed. War Room, Gwinnett County, the people's voice. Thank you for tuning in to War Room, Gwinnett County. I'm your host, Antonio Jones. We're back with another important interview um, for the Office of Sheriff here in Gwinnett County. It's no secret that a lot of us citizens here in Gwinnett have a lot of concerns about the direction that the county is going. Today, we're going to ask some of the questions that you, the audience, had for the upcoming sheriff. Um, and also, um, we need everybody to like, share, and subscribe to the channel. Um, that's the most important thing that we can do. Um, so a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, for those who are just tuning in, tuning in to the war room and you may not have an idea of what we're doing here, we basically created what we like to call the public square. This is where the people in Gwinnett get to come. Um, we are a source that's closest to the people. We're out here having conversations every day with the citizens here in Gwinnett. So this provides an opportunity for us to come together, discuss our concerns about everything that's going on in the county. Um, this is your voice. Uh, the War Room does not exist without we, the people. So uh, we think it's imperative that we we um, have a platform like this so we don't have to wait on the mainstream to uh, trickle all the way down to deal with the issues that we may have here going on in the county. So we'll be focusing, you'll hear me say this over and over again, the top five areas. I like to call these the five, fab five areas. One, <clears throat> the county commission. Very important uh, position. Number two, and these the level of importance, uh, it doesn't, you know, the, the order that I'm giving, uh, these things can change around. Uh, the next office, the district attorney, a very important office. Uh, city council, uh, another important office. Um, you have the sheriff office. And, uh, you know, that's uh, the, the last office uh, escapes me. But those offices are so important uh, to the show, because if you don't have law and order, um, you don't have anything. Um, that's what we need to have a civil society. So we're going to get right into it. We're going to bring in Baron Reinhold. Baron, welcome to the war room. Um. We're just going to start off by letting you tell the people who you are, what your platform is, and um, why you decided to run for sheriff here in Gwinnett County. Sure. Uh, thanks. It's great to be here, uh, Antonio. Thanks for uh, having me on the war room. Um, I, I think the school board was the last one on your on your list. Oh, yeah. So you've, you've been paying attention. Yeah, that's yeah the school board. That's what actually got me started with oh. um, even doing this. Sure. Oh, and uh, I, I forgot to mention this. So there was there were storms coming through the area, um, and um, it zapped the power. We had to do a complete reboot, and um, we put the word out on Facebook because we're we're normally right on time with everything. So um, pardon our delay. So we'll we'll let Baron take it from here. Okay. Um, well, again, uh, thanks. It's great to be here. This is a great service that uh, you do for the county. Um, so I am, I'm, I'm running for the office of sheriff. Um, there's all kinds of reasons um, and we can go through those. Um, but I think one of the, the biggest things that uh, would distinguish me from probably most everybody else, first and foremost, would be, uh, I'm a 35 year Navy veteran. I spent 35 years taking the oath to the um, US constitution. And I take that very seriously. Uh, a lot of people just use that as a swearing in ceremony and and kind of a photo op. But the reality is our constitution is under assault uh, at le every level, the uh, federal, state and local level. And so it's one thing that I take very seriously is, is the oath of office and the fact that um, that the, the, the people of Gwinnett, the citizens of Gwinnett, the number one job of the sheriff is to protect the civil rights, the constitutional rights of the citizens of Gwinnett against anybody who would trample on them. So that could be at any level. And if you don't understand the Constitution, there's no way that you can do the, the or perform your job or uh, fulfill your oath of office as the sheriff. 
because there are laws out there that are not constitutional and you have no business enforcing those. In fact, you have every um, you know reason not to and you shouldn't. Um, those are uh, you know one thing that you, you probably won't hear other people talking about. Um, as far as um, my qualifications, like I said, I'm a 35 year Navy veteran. I was I'm a retired Navy captain. I've served at every level um, over over the years. Uh, I've led um, larger organizations, a lot larger organizations. I've got uh, you know, uh, qualifications and have, have uh, served at levels that nobody else in in this race uh, has served at. Um, I've gotten one, one huge thing that I'm sure that we'll talk about are, are the leadership issues uh, in the current uh, sheriff's office. I mean, by every metric that I can uh, uh, articulate, uh, the you know the sheriff is failing in his role as a as a leader, and as the senior law enforcement officer in Gwinnett County, that's a huge problem for all the citizens of our county because we're the ones who are paying the bills and are not getting the uh, the, the service and. Uh, as importantly, if not more importantly, the sheriff's deputies are are under uh, siege, if you will. Um, I've, I've talked to a, a lot of people that have left the sheriff's department. I did ride along with a former sheriff's deputy um, a few weeks ago when I was doing the um, uh, civilian, not civilian, what do they call it? Citizens uh, Police uh, Academy. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> And you just listen to the way that they're not supported and uh, and the, the the bad leadership. And you when you when you're a poor leader, you can't maintain the people in your department. They started fleeing, you know, shortly after uh, Kibo took over. And you can't retain because it's a tight knit community. When you go to recruit people, they, the words out on okay, this is not the place you want to work because the people are under siege. I mean, the the, the people that are left in the department right now are okay. I'm I'm. I'm getting close to retirement. I want a couple more years so I can get out with my you know, whatever um, additional pay. But uh, it's a, it's across the board. And uh, you talk yeah. to people that are inside, they're afraid of talking about uh, the, the situation that they're um, serving under. Um, I've got a history of every unit that I've worked in and every unit that I've led. We've, we've got um, awards, every award that you can uh, earn um, across the nation and excellence awards and unit morale, unit retention, equal opportunity, command climate, battle effectiveness, go on and on and on. And mm -hmm. I know how to motivate people. I know how to make units run efficiently. I know how to take advice from people. I know how to put smart people in positions of authority and to grant them the um, the space that they need to do their job. I know how to motivate organizations and I know how to get stuff done. And we need every one of those assets right now in the sheriff's office. Right. So when, when I, when you say um, like for us, the qualifications uh, we're hearing that the, um, the bar has been lowered to uh, qualify officers to get them in. So um, what is your take on that? And, um, would that be something that you'd be interested in potentially raising the bar back to uh, assure that the military, we've seen things occur that should never occur. You should never, ever lower standards. What what that means is you've got a leadership problem and not uh, being able to go out there and motivate people and to get the best and brightest. And to, uh, you don't want you don't want a, a deputy or anybody in law enforcement who is. Uh, not a sustained superior performer. Period. We we deserve that as the citizens of the county. Too much, too much bad can happen when somebody is in law enforcement and and they're not uh, trained to the highest standards. And you only and you know this. Everybody knows this. You only need a handful of bad incidents, and it's a catastrophe uh, for PR. It's a catastrophe for morale for the unit. If one bad, if one person does something really stupid because they weren't trained well. Then it's a reflection. Everybody assumes that it's the whole shooting match. And we, we, in the military, we used to call that the strategic corporal. You get somebody who's not trained. They go out to Abu Ghraib. They're not supervised properly. And the you know the handful of people that abuse a prisoner or do whatever else, and it goes global. And all of a sudden, you're losing support from allies. You're losing basing privileges. 
and so forth and so on. And so here at the county level, it's no different. When, when, you, when you have a situation that where people aren't trained properly, you know, inmates die. It, you know, people aren't, uh, you know, people on the, you know, going in to serve warrants aren't trained properly, then the, the, it endangers the deputies' lives. I mean, right. at, at every level, it's, it's, it's it, you don't compromise on standards, period. Right. So, look, that's, that's a good tee up for um, the, uh, another question that's kind of attached to that. So, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, we just saw where the Supreme Court pretty much zapped affirmative action. What are your thoughts on your leadership as it ties into the ever um, snowballing effect that we have for different agencies and companies and stuff to push diversity, equity, and, and inclusion? It, it it seems more, you know, um, like a, a, a political thing than anything else. So how would your leadership um, entertain that on either – continuing that or pushing back on that idea well here, here's the reality everybody wants the best and brightest serving period the only thing that anybody should ever be concerned about in the position of, of leadership is getting the best and brightest and sustained superior performance everything else it doesn't matter i don't care if you're a pink flamingo if you can execute your job better than anybody else then i want more pink flamingos you know it, again the, the whole injection of of uh, race and of all these other things into it and we need this percentage of this and that percentage of that you're, you're that shouldn't factor in as a matter of fact i've i've led organizations where i've had i didn't i could i could uh command advance it's called a cap in the navy i could command advance a certain number of people at different levels in in rank and you only have so many as your tenure as a commanding officer when i finished command advancing my last person over a period of a year, I got, uh, a senior chief walked up to me and said, sir, did you realize that uh, all of the people that you capped this year were African-American? And I sat there and I'm like thinking, going through my head who I capped. I was like, okay, yeah. Were they the best people at their jobs in, the, in, this, in this unit? And he said, yeah. I said, so what, what do you, why are we having this conversation? Right. I so mean, when they, like, so, I don't so... care, I don't care. <laughs> Yeah, you know, my last job in the Navy, I ran six units. I ran, I was the NROTC commanding officer for Georgia Tech. We had cross towns at Georgia State and Kennesaw State. And then I had another cross town school at Morehouse and I had Spelman and Clark Atlanta. At, uh, and there was one standard. There were, and you achieved the standard. You worked to the standard and you, you commissioned or didn't commission officers based on the standard. And you see where the, you know, where the deficiencies are, for example, uh, you know, the, the, I had three historically black colleges and three large state schools. And there was a uh, nationally, there was a 23% delta between the commissioning rates of, at HBCUs and non HBCUs. And I was like, this is crazy. So I had all of the presidents, all the provosts, all of the um, commanding officers of every HBCU in the country, my admiral staff, and all come down to Morehouse for the first ever national HBCU summit, leadership summit, to figure out, okay, what is this, what's going on? We, we can fix this. There's things the school can do and there's things the Navy can do to, uh, to, to close this gap. So let's sit down and figure that out and, and press on. Uh, so you don't change the standard. You figure out what the issues are and you address the issues. And then you talk to people if they're not performing, you give them, you articulate them, communicate to them. Okay, you're not performing in areas X, Y, and Z. You give them the opportunity to improve. You just give them feedback. And then if they're not improving, you counsel them again. And you, you get to the point of, okay, either they're incapable of improving, in which case, if they've been trying and they're just not capable, then I'll help them. I'll write a letter of recommendation for another job and, you know, in another industry or whatever and help them. But if they're just, you know, lazy or a slacker or whatever else, it's like, listen, you can put me down as a reference, but I wouldn't if I were you. And you just get them out of your organization, and you get somebody who can perform. I mean, that's that's what you do. Right. Period. So, so you you're basically saying when you get the knock on the door from maybe a higher up, and they're saying, you know, hey, we we don't think we have enough Asian uh, black guys or whatever guys or white guys <clears throat> on there. You're gonna go and tell them to get a life, basically that you're gonna well, that that you're gonna <laughs> staff based on qualifications yeah. and uh and achievement. And that's that because that's the best thing for the people. 
Well, I, I will tell you, and this would take a lot longer than your show permits, but <laughs> in my, in my, um, it, when I was a CEO, that, that exact scenario happened. Somebody had uh, lied on a security upgrade. There was a bunch of other things. They had to get a top secret SCI SAP clearance and all this other stuff to get into our unit. They lied on that. There was a whole bunch of other things that came along with that. And I was told by my commanding officer that we were, because we were going to take this individual to mast, that we, you couldn't, uh, or he didn't want us to do that, just find another set of orders for him, which, okay, you never pass your, your problems on to somebody else. You deal with your problems. And yeah, I, I, I told the Commodore, I was like, listen, you know, are, is that an order or is that a suggestion? Because he couldn't give me that order. He could relieve me, but he couldn't give me that order. It's my command. And he said, it's a strong suggestion. Well, when that happened, my ranking out of all the other CEOs went from number one to, you know, dead last because I wouldn't do what I was, what was an unethical. And, and oh, and so the, to, to your, to your, the rest of your story, he was the only African-American pilot in our wing. So the, they, the, com, the Commodore did not want to take any heat or, you know, get anybody in an uproar because this guy was going to mast. And it's like, okay, well, you know, <laughs> did he or did he not lie on a security form to the federal government? You don't want an officer who's going to lie on a security upgrade to be in charge of your people, especially because our unit was in combat 24-7, 365 for decades. And you don't put that kind of people in charge of people. You don't. They're not trustworthy. That's right. And and good leaders, um, they pay attention to all the details. I mean, I, I played um, football all the way through college. That's from Little League all the way up. And every Every coach that I had, I was blessed enough to be able to have guys that paid attention to the details. And the person's character, you know, the, the, the composition of the team is going to be made up of all these different characters that you have. And that leader's job is to uh, cultivate them and manage them in such a way to where he sets that standard and they, they have to meet that standard. Our Absolutely. coach, uh, my college coach, he said, have the um the um, assistant coaches, they were at our classrooms. I mean, like, we had to be there 15 minutes before the the uh, class started, or we was con considered late. He wanted wow. us to do well, and he knew that our attitude and how we respected ourselves and represented the team in the classroom, that always translates over to the, the field. And um, because of his persistence, when he came in, and when we came in, we, when he came in, the team was like two and nine. I mean, he had to fight us and um, leadership just, you know, everywhere have to understand that this, it's, it's not their job to be the most well-liked guy. You know, every, you know, it, it was some guys on the team that I played with, you know, that I know absolutely detested the coach. And a lot of people didn't like the coach because he was the one that had to push everybody. But at the, when, when the, the trophies and the rings and stuff come out, He's the, he's the guy everybody's holding up on the shoulder. Right. So a, a great leader sees that through when everybody else um, don't understand that. So I agree. You, well, you, but, yeah. yeah, your job is not to be everybody's friend. However, I will say that when you can accomplish all that and have an incredible uh, camaraderie and have everybody uh, enjoy spending time not only with each other but with you, then that's a whole, that's a game changer. I mean, that's when a, an organization goes from good to, you know, absolutely insane. Uh, I used to have, mm -hmm. and this was against the rules the first couple of years, <laughs> against the national regulations. Um, uh, but one of the things I was told by my admiral when I took over uh, the ROTC unit was, listen, you're supposed to train these kids just like they train them at the Naval Academy. I went to the Naval Academy, so I know how I was trained there. So I, I, the, one of the first things I did um, was say, hey, all of the seniors, we're going to have a, um, a, a social at the CO's house. You're going to learn how to engage in a, in a kind of formal setting. You can bring a date. I'm going to have my staff up there and we're going to have, you know, drinks, cocktails, poo-poos, whatever. And because um, the first time you do this was, isn't when you should be uh, subject to the UCMJ. So they came up and I drove them hard. I mean, we changed, we utterly changed NROTC Atlanta region. I mean, it was, I've got a list of about 70 things. We changed things at the national level, at the local level, in the regional level, um, you know, uh, in, in those four years. Um, but they, one of the highlights of their year 
was coming up to uh, my house and just enjoying. We worked our butts off, but there's a time to let down your hair occasionally and to really enjoy, you know, fellowship. And they loved that. And the, the, what that bred in the unit uh, was amazing because the other thing I was fighting was, okay, we've got all this stuff going on between races and this and that. And now I've got what? I've got two physically geographically separate units. You got Georgia Tech and you got Morehouse. So to work that tension uh, against the culture, I, the first thing I did that first summer was I said, okay, we're, gonna, we're not gonna do two different, um, uh, if you will, basic trainings. All six schools are going down to uh, Fort Benning, and we're gonna we're gonna do basic training down there together as all six schools, and that welded the kids together across the units. And then they when the, you know when they came up here, you know the, you know is again you provide environments for you know people to engage with each other, and they it be it welded six schools that were very different together, and the mids had each other's back. And and I'm not saying that there's never any problems. But there's always gonna be somebody saying something stupid. They don't think about it. And, trigger something, whatever. But you deal with that as a, as a case by case basis. But as, as far as the whole unit goes, you can go from, you know, a crap organization to just, you know, lights out the best of the best. Uh, it just takes good leadership. And I, yeah. you know, I will never and have, have never expected anything more out of anybody that's worked for me than I will do myself. And, and, and actually, I, I don't expect people to, to work as hard as I do because my passion for people and for excellence, um, you know, is something that I try to weld into everybody else and have successfully done so. But the thing is, there's so many things that all the time that I'm trying to go from a phenomenal organization to the model for the entire you know, Navy or the entire, in this case, the entire country uh, for what a sheriff's office, you know, what a sheriff should look like and what they should be doing. Right. So that's, I'm, I'm glad you said that because a, a lot of people will look at the county and, and see um, a, a county in distress or in shambles. And it's just, just like the, in the book of Nehemiah in the Bible, you know, a, a lot of people complained about the rubble, but when, when Nehemiah came up, he saw the potential of the, the underpinnings of, the materials to be able to build a wall. Right. And so if, you know, if anybody that's working in government right now here today, it's, it's no secret. We have a, a lot of depravity that's floating around, but it's our job to make the hard decisions. And yeah. anybody that takes a seat in government right now, they have to understand that the, the decisions of what's uh, because of what's going on are going to be very difficult. But that's why we need good, strong leaders in place that understand um, th that that's going to be their position for a while. And oh. um, it'll it'll get better, you know, but we we have to we have to put the pick in the ground and bust the ground up. That, that's here, just that's just where we the reality, are. reality, though, of what I found. And in order for positive change to happen, you have to have principle. And in order to stand on principle, you have to have principle. So what does that mean? If you don't believe in an absolute standard, then what are you measuring the rightness or wrongness of an issue? What are you res? Yeah. You know? So I think the biggest problem is you just don't have people that believe in absolutes very frequently anymore. I mean, most people fear man more than God, or they would rather self indulge than know that they're going to face an almighty, you know, creator. And not me. I mean, you know, I would much. <laughs> I don't care what anybody else says. I'm going to do what's right because. I mean, I'm not perfect, but I'm, I'm going to, you know, I'm, I'm trying to be, <laughs> and I'm going to, I don't care who tells me, uh, you know, if I know the constitution and I know the, the, the Bible as well as I do, and I know where I'm going, you know, after this life, then you don't have anything to worry about. I mean, in the military on these missions that we would go out on, listen, if it's not my day to die, I don't care what comes what comes up at me. It's not going to take me out. And if it's my day to die, nothing's going to stop it. So I don't have to worry about anything. I just do the mission and execute with with you know with a hundred percent intensity and move on. You don't that's, have to worry that's about right. It's like that. That's right. And, and same thing when it comes to doing what's right and what's wrong. Listen, a lot of times when you do what's right, you're going to bring the ire of the organization down. For example. I, I gave a speech down at uh, Morehouse uh, in December. I, I did the commissioning ceremony down there, and I told them, "Listen, I'm not I'm not denigrating battlefield 
valor. You, don't get me wrong. Uh, you know, uncommon valor is extremely common on the battlefield. There's incredible bravery that you see everywhere. What I, but what I'm about to say is the most courageous person that I've known in 35 years in the Navy that has worked for me is a, a woman who went on, she was commander. She was relieved of command because she refused to take the vaccination that she believed was unconstitutional, that went against the law, the stated law, and was against the Nuremberg Code. And she tried to get a waiver, a religious waiver, and she tried to get any waiver she could get, and she couldn't get one. And all of a sudden, the first time I'm aware of this is when she's on the front cover of the Navy Times being slandered by the Navy for and relieved of command and being forced out of the military a year early. So, she, you know, she, you have to have three years in your current rate or your current um, uh, as an 05. She was a commander. So your current rank in order to retire at that rank. So they were going to make her retire as a lieutenant commander, which means essentially they're stealing money from her for the rest of her life because she had the, you know, the will to to bear the, you know, to bear the brunt of the entire chain of command from the president all the way down to her, her superior and say, this is not constitutional. It's not a legal order. And therefore, I'm not doing it. It's it's sad, but she, I mean, I have more respect for her than just about anybody else I've seen because she stood her she stood firm. And most people, most people, you know, I, I'll tell you this: I, all of my classmates are one, two, or three star generals or admirals, and I've spoken with a lot of them behind the scenes. And a lot of my buddies are, are uh, captains or guys that used to work for me, commanders. And behind the scenes, they'll tell you they most of them will will completely agree. With, with what I believe, but not who's standing firm, who's saying it publicly. I mean, yeah. I would much rather be relieved of command or even stand court martial and go to Leavenworth knowing that I'm doing the right thing than, yes. than cave and pretend all this foolishness is okay. That's right. And, and, and God will protect us. When the, when the founders wrote the Constitution, they knew that what was going to be the glue and the foundation of this standing was going to be, you know, um, admiration for and, and respect and regard for the, the living God is like any other thing. You know what I'm saying? Even if it's a marriage, you know, it's the glue. It's what holds it. Otherwise, it's just my word against yours. Um, who who has the most, um, uh, who more popular this day or what's more popular this day? But no, 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 no. What, what, what does the creator think about this you know and well, they knew fun, that. I, I used to teach leadership and ethics it was the capstone course for all the seniors and every day in class we asked what's right and how do you know T 10 seconds into that if you're teaching the class the way i did you're into a worldview class i figured somebody was going to videotape this and i was going to lose my job like the first week i was in class <laughs> uh because i laid it on thick i mean every day i just rolled a grenade in and blew it up and force people against the wall to think about what they actually believe. I was like, I spent a lot of time. I said, I designed this class for you to get an A. So don't worry about that. You're gonna have to work because I'm also smart enough to know, because I was one of you <laughs> once, uh, you know, I would only do as much work as I needed to to get the grade. But we're, the most important thing in this class is to get you to think about your worldview and if it holds water or not. And if it doesn't, you need to think about modifying it. And I mean, the first day was so funny. I should send this to you. You'd die. I, I, just by putting this survey out there, I probably could have gotten, you know, relieved the command or anyway, but I just made up a, a simple thing, a true false. I gave it to him the last couple minutes of class. They had two minutes to fill this out. I had like 50, 40, 50 questions. And I just, the, so I said some softballs early on true or false. Is it okay to lie? Is it okay to cheat? Is it okay to steal? Are there absolute laws of, physics or their absolute laws of mathematics. Da, da, da. But then I start getting into, you know, the, the tough questions. Um, you know, is it okay to, I said anything, you know, is it, is pedophilia okay? Is necrophilia okay? Is everything, I threw the whole kitchen sink in there. And, you know, is, is, uh, is it okay for two 18 year olds to have sex? 18, 17, 16, 15, 18, 14, 13. To, uh, what about a 40 year old and 18, 40 year old and went all the way down and had them fill that out. And then the next day in class, we talked about it and it was a, it was an anonymous thing. So I, I obviously wanted to get a true answer from him. But I said, who in here thinks they got 100 percent on the quiz yesterday? 
And all of a sudden it was like a preparation H commercial. They're like, oh my God. And I was, I was like, I, I think I got hundred percent. Why are you guys not saying you got hundred percent? But the, the point of the evolution oh. is you're a relativist if you don't have an absolute standard by which to measure what's right or what's wrong. So the question really becomes, what is your standard? And how much do you believe in your standard? I mean, I believe I know the standard and I'm willing to die for what I believe is right and what's wrong or suffer whatever consequences for that. And if you don't right. believe that, then you can't be a great leader. You can't. Right. And there That's aren't right. that many people that are willing to sacrifice everything. I mean, our founding fathers were. They pledged their lives, their, you know, their sacred honor, their fortunes, the whole everything to do what they believed was right. They knew that if they got caught, they were going to get strung up by the Brits. They did it anyway. They did. You have to have that kind of resolve if you want to be an, a, a great leader. That's right. For those that's tuning in, um, we're in, interviewing Baron Rainhole, sheriff uh, candidate for Gwinnett County. Make sure you like, share, and subscribe. Um, you know, and invite a friend to the page. Um, uh, Gwinnett War Room, Gwinnett County is the public square that we've created. Uh, this is for we the people of Gwinnett County, and this is where we come to hear the candidates. Um, we do all of this un unscripted. Uh, this is live. You get a a, a, a real an analysis of who the candidates are and everything. You get to see their facial expressions, the way they answer questions. Um, 80 plus percent of the questions that we're asking comes right from you. You know, so um, it's important to share this page, get involved, use your human agency. And um, we got to fight for the for the county. I tell people on the streets that I see every single day. We are in Gwinnett County. We are the state of the state. Well, what does that mean? If we don't hold the line, push back and dominate, we have to dominate the county. When I'm out talking to guys, I've been talking to guys, people that know me know I, I run a, um, a lawn maintenance landscape company. I talk to guys at the gas station. I talk to neighbors of people where we do services at, and I just ask them, <clears throat> um, what are what do you want, you know, in your county? They want safe schools. They want a district attorney, a sheriff that's going to do their job. They detest all of this high density housing. They just I mean, they can't stand it. You know, um, I'm going to have pretty soon some of the people come on the show. So that you don't just think it's this is my opinion. It's not my opinion. Mm -hmm. They support the police or whatever. They don't buy into um all the diversity and the racial division. I mean, I saw pictures from the Snailville um, 4th of July thing they had yesterday. We did something here at the house. So um, my family, we didn't go. We just had some close friends over. But um, all different backgrounds. You know, there's nobody out there, um, you know, thinking about anything other than having fun. So we've got to take this race issue off of the docket, period. I mean, it's just like a, it's, it's a no brainer. You know, it's, it's all political and it's all attached to a, an agenda that does not align with what the people want in this county. So um, we, we're going to move on to another question that we got. Um, let's see. So there was a shower or something or a floor in the um, in the sheriff's office that we heard that was converted into a shower, a bathroom and something else. And um, from what we hear, uh, the office space there was limited. Now, we don't know if they've built on or anything like that since that point. But uh, a question was, would you convert that area back into an area for, I guess, the deputies or staff and everybody so that they can have more space? What? Well, here's, here's the right answer to every one of the questions, which I firmly believe in. You do everything in your organization to 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 accomplish the mission and how you spend funds is a portion is a huge portion of that. Uh, you know, financial accountability is a huge portion of that. But even more fundamental than that is not putting yourself first just because you're the head, you know, the, the lead sled dog or whatever the organization. I mean, you should put yourself last you should be the servant of everybody not only in your organization 
but the servant of everybody in the county. You should be accessible to people. You should invite uh, them to come in and criticize and, and or to give you uh, their input. I mean, so wait, you, you, so you mean you willing to take the makeup counter out and everything? Oh my gosh! <laughs> That's I mean, the reality, you know, looking at that, you know, it, it would be another financial decision. Okay, well, what's gonna, what's it gonna cost to reconvert this and everything else? But certainly, you know, the, the, you know, the big picture thing is, I have no, I have, I don't expect anything more than anybody than the least person in my organization. I, I don't. I mean, that's just well, that's, plain and simple. Well, that, that's that's a fair answer. That's good. Good leadership puts, um, you know, the force and everybody else first because that's any times it's, it's any other way. <laughs> you're just eating wall. that morale, yeah. you know, any other way. Kick a hole in right. the wall and, and make it a public you know, a public bathroom for <laughs> everybody on my floor. <laughs> All right, so let's let's move to uh, another question um, from the audience. Um, let's see. Okay, we did. We had a cold open on the last interview. I didn't, you know, when didn't want to play a repeat. But basically, the district attorney, uh, that office prose prosecutions is at fifty. According to WSB, this is not not the people of the war room. Right. But according to research and uh, investigation from WSB, her prosecutions are like fifty seven percent. I mean, the surrounding counties are like north of 80 something percent yeah, so 87 to 100 percent are, the, are eight, all the other counties so my, my question is she was hired you know so this is you know you could correct me and fill in if you need to so the police force goes out you know catch people committing crimes or whatever suspected crimes and then they're, they're like a quarterback then they throw the ball to the district attorney to make a score based on all of the evidence and you know each person has the right to have a, an attorney and everything we most everybody know the law to de defend themselves but during her campaign um what i was hearing a lot of was we need to prosecute in a equitable manner and uh um you know and i saw some footage of her office making a deal or the person that was reporting was saying she went down to make a deal so that this person that has supposedly committed a crime could make bond or, or bail or whatever. That's just that signals to criminals that, hey, you got a, a few chances. You know, what What are your thoughts on that? What that could potentially do to the morale for police officers that are getting up every single day, risking their lives, you know, their wives and children don't know if they're going to return home. And then the ball get tossed to the to the D.A., and she's got like a 50 percent um, rate of, of prosecutions. Yeah, successful. No, it, it's a it's devastating. It's a disaster and it's a disgrace because you need a, if a 57 last I checked was an F an 87, which is what are or to or 100 percent, which is our other counties, is a high B or an A. Why? I mean, the but it, it's obvious why that is, because if you listen to what she has said, you know, she, she, again, when you factor in anything else other than, OK, <laughs> this is a murder and we're going to prosecute it as such. And we're not going to um, try to get people off for a lighter sentence or this or that at the other. Your job is to put murderers away and to make the county safer, not to infuse whatever other personal beliefs you have into the job that you that you've been you know, appointed to or uh, elected to. When you do that, then you're you're in dereliction of your duty. You're not doing. I mean, I can't imagine not only not only the the um, law enforcement how devastating that is when when you go the extra mile to have everything um, teed up for a conviction and then they drop the ball on their end. But what about the people whose family members have died and you've got some rogue DA who's got some agenda and they let. They, they, they let a murderer off because of whatever their agenda is. I mean, that's crazy. It and is. And we, the, we've and gotten inboxes. Yeah, when, go when you have a multi-tiered system of justice or you've got people with all these crazy rogue agendas and they're not following the law and they're not following the Constitution, that is a flamethrower on a pressure cooker. And eventually, I don't care what metal you got in that pressure cooker, it's going to blow. 
And we've got so much crazy stuff going on in this country at every level. Um, I mean, I, I'm talking firsthand. I've spent most of my adult life overseas in these countries that are failed states. Um, be, and you see what happens to you know the tyrants who keep becoming more tyrannical. Crazy stuff ends up eventually happening. That's not good. And this is part of that crazy. When you've got when you're not prosecuting criminals the way they should be prosecuted, and you're letting murderers or hardened criminals off. Uh, because of you've got some pet agenda that's wrong so the Gwinnett County Commission they're pretty much in control of the appropriations of fund and budgets to these right. different offices yep so we need Nicole in this whole um board to get on task you're basically the coach and these are your players out here and funds, the taxpayer money is being given to these offices, and one, the district attorney uh, specifically, 57%? This, this, this isn't right. You know, this is not good for the county. It's not good. It signals to criminals that, hey, come on over here. You know, um, we're going to give you a chance. You know, we're, our, our district attorney is, is potentially engaging in uh, social work uh behavior. No, when it gets to the DA office, you're trying to slam dunk the ball. And if right. the person is not guilty, it's up to that uh, criminals or supposed criminal uh, criminals attorney to prove that in a court of law to a jury and or a judge. It's not your job to be uh, passing out and worrying about who had a second chance and a bad life. That's social work. Right. And, and this is the other reason why discipline at schools is so important, because you have first the family. That's your first um, stoppage of, you know, uh, correcting someone before they go out in the world. Then a lot of people get that opportunity when they go to the schools. But if you got loose disciplinary policies there, OK, these these kids are one day going to grow up and be in the public um, sphere. So now this is just breeding more and more crime or criminal activity for the sheriff and for the citizens to have to deal with fund and pay for. By the time you land in the sheriff's office, no criminal should be thinking about, or, or the DA is coming after you or getting ready to prosecute you. There should be no thought in that criminal's mind or suppose it quote unquote accused or alleged criminal's mind that my district attorney it's going to be light on me because, you know, you know, I had a hard life or whatever the case may be. Many of us have, have had hard lives and most of us have had an opportunity to make a different choice. And we just decided to go down the wrong road. Removing the consequences is not the answer. Can agree. you agree with that? Oh, yeah. Yep. All right. So let's let's move on to another um, question that's. Um, I don't want to say this question is even controversial. I mean, 287G. A lot of people want, want to know. Let, let me go through this before, before uh, we get you to answer this question about 287G. So at the border, in the places where it's been breached, um, and there's definitely a dereliction of duty of our federal government, rape kits are being found that are being passed out by NGOs. Um Maps showing illegal aliens how to cross the border. Abortion pills are being handed out because they know that these women and children are going to be taken advantage of. Um, there's reported over 10,000 people per day illegally crossing the border. Over 85 north of 85,000 kids um, are missing. Um, what is your thought on 287G um, if if elected? Because some people are asking, is this going to be reinstated? Now, we do know that or believe that the federal government, I guess, has to support, I guess, the deportation. I think it's, you know, you guys would detain a person if you if each person that was arrested, you just do a general check. You know, is this person a citizen of uh, a, a legal citizen of the United States? Uh, what are your thoughts on this on this? Sure. Well, first of all, I, I think it's interesting that um, <laughs> that 287G, obviously, uh, you know, Sheriff Taylor, that was one of the first things he did in office was dismantle that. Um, 
he didn't dismantle it because it wasn't a good idea. He actually said on multiple occasions that it's a tool and it's a very good tool, but it just hasn't been managed properly. So it's like, okay, if it's a good tool and it hasn't been managed properly and you're the senior leader, why are you throwing the tool away? Now, put all that aside, what is 287G? I'm, you, you, most of your uh, audience, I'm sure, is probably aware of it. But essentially, yeah, in a nutshell, um, well, let, let's dispel the myth from the truth because there's been a lot of myth out there. The truth is it doesn't even kick in until law enforcement has arrested somebody and brought them down to book them into the jail. And then while they're being booked in and being fingerprinted, a series of questions gets asked. And one of the a couple of the questions are, are you what country were you born in and are you a U.S. citizen? And so you determine at that point, is this person a citizen or not? If they are not and they've been arrested for something that was a, you know, what was an arrestable offense. OK, now things kick in. So 287 G um, was the was is the is a process where deputies are sent by the county up to um to charleston south carolina to get trained for a month in which the county picks up the bill for that and ice picks up the bill for the training and any other equipment the equipment being um you know stuff that they come back with uh, access to databases um uh they get training in multicultural communication and avoidance of racial profiling and all this other stuff okay so so then it basically expedites their the deputy's ability to uh because they're a deputized ice agent to expedite all the ice you know processes okay that's not a so there's there's a couple of things i absolutely am will always put uh the, the citizens of Gwinnett county first getting criminals off the streets and if they're illegal criminals um that are preying on people getting them out of the country and deported will always be a priority um so that's that's key now how to do that do you do it under 287g or not i just got off the phone with about an hour conversation with the person from ice who had a 30 plus year career in it and was i uh, oversaw several states because my concerns are you know one you know financial two um are there ways to do this without being deputized ice agents because you know personally i don't like the thought of having divided chains of command within my my unit period if you're a, de a sheriff of Gwinnett county deputy in a deputy of another federal agency which federal agencies in case you haven't been reading the news have not had a good track record in the last several years so i don't want to invite daily oversight and you have to be inspected by them you've got to go through all these things recertifications all this other stuff i'm not interested in that i'm interested in all the benefit without having to pay the three million dollar bill for what comes along with that and there are ways to do that uh, as a matter of fact I've, uh, I've, I've i've talked about nuanced ways to get the same benefit of that without having to pay for it or the the moniker of you know giving ammo which i don't care about giving ammo to people who are going to because they're going to criticize you for something else they don't like about whatever you're doing but i but <clears throat> the just the term 287g so many people have missed characterize that and believe wrong things about it just that thing evokes some type of you know visceral reaction in some people and the reality is it's mostly because they're ignorant or because in any anything that happens there's going to be a portion of the time when unintended consequences happen so if somebody for example gets pulled over they get in a wreck finds out that uh i don't know there was an accident the person you know somebody in the other car got injured they got arrested for vehicular homicide or whatever they whatever it is somebody doesn't have isn't a u.s citizen and just an accident happened well okay when when the tearjerker and i'm i'm not being uncompassionate i'm just saying there are situations where people who otherwise have, have obeyed the laws but are here illegally get wrapped up and get exported well that's not who they're targeting they're targeting people after they've been arrested and are downtown and getting booked in that need to leave that need to be out of here for the safety because if they get a light sentence by by whatever judge or whatever else and they walk out of the jail they're back on the streets if ice isn't there to pick them up and to get them out, out of the country it, i don't want criminals on the streets i don't think anybody any of our citizens want hardened criminals on the streets and that's essentially what 287g is but to answer your question there are ways to get the benefits of 287g 
without spending that and without having a divided uh, department, I believe. And from uh, you know, and, I, and I've talked to, again the experts in this area. I think that it can be done. So I will do it that way because I don't. I'm not interested in the federal agency sitting in my, yeah. you know, sitting in my sheriff's office. Right. So, yeah, I think that people are more concerned about the um, the consequences of having people here that don't belong. I mean, right. we are a nation of immigrants. You, everybody knows that. Um, but if we're going to do something, let's do it the right way. Come in just like everybody else does. You know, we don't, if somebody sneaks in your house tonight, you don't let them set up shop in the basement and be like, oh yeah, this person needs a roof. Nobody does that. We have to protect, uh, you know, our our state and county and, and our borders. Yeah. And uh, when nobody else is doing it, we need people to step up and do it because well, I, I believe I, 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 I helped found a, I co-founded a, a, a Christian organization in 2007, Middle East Missions. And just last week I flew down to Florida and somebody that we've been trying to get their citizenship for, you know, over a decade, finally got it. It's a long process Does it need to be that long. Probably not with, you know, why don't we put pressure on, on that end of it and get people in here legally. Right. But we are a nation of, or we're supposed to be, I don't say we are, we're supposed to be a nation of laws and it's supposed to be applied evenly. And the more that, that we deviate from that center line, the more, um, the more stress we put on society and, and, uh, and, you know, the more lawlessness we'll, we'll start seeing uh, yeah. as a result. So we've got to get back to you know, obeying laws. We there do. And we, and we rob the people that are wanting to come to the country, <clears throat> you know, for a, a better opportunity. I mean, I, I don't have a problem with that. But if we uh, allow this to happen up under those conditions, then that degrades the very thing and reason they're coming here. Sure. You know what I mean? So um, we, we, we must stay on top of that or what have you. And uh, I believe when a sheriff takes a, an oath of office, they um, it's to defend the Georgia Constitution, right? Absolutely. And is it also to oh, defend the U and state constitution? OK, so at that point, that person has a charge to abide by what the Constitution says. Right. It says that we are to defend our borders, right? Absolutely. And do everything within our jurisdiction and power in that office to do so and make the make the commission deal with it. Hey, I'm a sheriff. I'm doing my job for the, the citizens who elected me to be in here. Don't tell me not to do my job. And as a, according to the oath of office that I took, you know, maybe some of you guys need to go and look in the mirror, you know, well, that, maybe yeah, you need right. to that's, figure that's it out. Problem. It's not, it's not just in law enforcement. You know, the, the DOD has got the same issue. We swear the same oath, and yet how many people understand how to put that into action? For example, the other thing that happened on day one of, uh, or, you know, shortly after he took over was, uh, you know, Sheriff Taylor put a bunch of bonding companies out of business. We used to have 11. I think we got four now. And, okay, so if your oath, again, to take office is to preserve life, liberty, and property. Yeah, I just, I just read office, that. I, I pulled it up. The first week in office. You deprived three companies the rights to life, liberty, and property. So you did the antithesis of what you were supposed to do on day one by by not protecting people with you know the 287G because it was a political hot potato. Then you got rid you didn't protect your deputies in the jail because you got rid of the rapid reaction force and all of a sudden deputy uh injury rates went through the roof. And incidentally, as people were leaving because they couldn't be protected by their own sheriff, you know, you've got you know, sometimes, you know, 12, 15 people in a jail that's supposed to have 60, you know, 50, 60 people uh, in, a, in, the, in the jail, deputies, uh, um, you know, serving there at any given time. You get down to that few people, injury rates skyrocket. Why would anybody stay in that environment? As a matter right. Fact, and you, that, go ahead. You, you put the inmates in, in danger, too, because it's like you, you're putting more frustration and stressed stress on your your staff that's managing the jail at the same time not only that the death rates skyrocketed i'm sure you're not unaware of the fact that you know the first two years in you know the kibo took over we had the highest death rates you know sometimes you know two and three times the the rate of 
of any of the other large counties around us. Okay, why is that? That's called a leadership problem. It's called when you're when you're a bad leader and you can't muster the right amount of people to run the jail safely, and then you take the overage and 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 um, you know and uh, people and you, you send inmates down to uh, jails on the Florida Georgia border at a cost of about fifty bucks a day, um, and you got to transport them down, bring them back for uh, for, for any type of. Um, you know, uh, court cases, drive them back down there. You're sapping that manpower. I mean, 50 bucks a day, you send 200 people down there, start doing the math, 50 bucks a day times 200 times 30 days, you're talking real money. And that's coming right out of the pocket because what? Because we have crappy leadership that can't get people to stay and no one will come and work for them. It's a huge problem. And, the, you know, the people of Gwinnett need, a lot of them know, but a lot of them don't. This has nothing to do with Republican, with Democrat, with this, that, or this. It has everything to do with leadership and knowing what your job is, knowing that you have an oath, being willing to sacrifice yourself for the oath if that's what's required. We have got to get back to serving the people and, and to make that a constitutional, you know, your position as a constitutional uh, law enforcement agent, you have got to know what your job is and you've got to be willing to, to do it and, and, and not make yourself the, the big thing, not put your name on every car like day three so that everybody gets to see your name, not run around and make a bathroom because, you know, you want your own bathroom, not lock off, you know, the, that floor of your, so people can't talk to you and give you feedback. I mean, the best one, one great thing about the military is that we have something called a command climate survey, an equal opportunity survey. It's combined together. What that is, is it's an anonymous survey given to every single person in your unit. And they get to fill out and give basically grade you and degrade the leadership. And you get that. And it's unbelievable feedback. Hopefully nothing's news to you. But if there is, it's anonymous. So, you know, you get to see, OK, there's if it's one or two data points on a certain issue, you got a you know, command of you know hundreds and hundreds of people. Okay, you got to take what's said with a grain of salt. But if there's a big ink blot there that you weren't aware of, unbelievable tool. Because you can go in there now, you know, wide-eyed and not realizing what was there and fix that and get mm -hmm. that and brief that out to your people. Okay, I was unaware of this. And it's to me, it's personally sad because I have an open door policy and I've told everybody, come in here <laughs> if it's an issue. If I'm if if the emperor's not wearing clothes, please somebody tell me. Um, yeah. So, you know, these kinds of things, you should invite feedback constantly and honest feedback and no, no retribution, no anything else. People should trust you. You have to earn their respect and their trust before they'll tell you the truth. But once once you've done that, then you're going to get feedback on a regular basis and you are going to be able to make adjustments on the fly and keep that, you know, keep that organization vectoring towards excellence because That's people right. trust you. That yeah. is not what happened is going on right now in the sheriff's. There's yeah. well, zero trust with most people. And the few that do trust him were the ones that were brought in. Um, and, you know, he placed in certain positions and, you know, you know, this, that and the other. But the average foot soldier that if they haven't already left, there's not a lot of trust because they don't see, you know, they don't see the respect. They don't see they, they see, you know, the leader for what he is. Yeah. So this is one of the things that, you know, was taught to me, you know, playing on teams, because I mean, serving as a sheriff is definitely a, a humongous undertaking and a, a team effort. Yep. Humility is the key to success. And if you're not willing to take that look in the mirror and get that feedback that you're talking about, then how are you going to, how, how does a person improve? I Listen, mean, you the, should the, cover you know? the feedback instead of playing whack-a-mole on anybody that says anything bad, you bash them in the head or yeah. you make them sign an NDA so they don't tell anybody else. Yeah, the, it, it's like they're at Chuck E. Cheese trying to, you know, the, the little thing has got the heads popping up and you got the hammer trying to knock them, knock them down. <laughs> it's the mole popping his head up and you hit it down. Yeah, instead of just dealing with it. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Exactly. So, look, we're, we're interviewing um, Baron Rainhole, Sheriff for Gwinnett County. Um, you know, make sure you like, share, and subscribe. Share this video. Um, you're tuned into the Gwinnett County Public Square. This is for the people, by the people. Uh, these are your questions that I'm asking him. You get a chance to see his response, his reactions in real time. None of this is scripted. What you see 
is is what you get. Um, be be a, become a part of you know the human agency that we're gonna need. Gwinnett County is the state of the state. So get that in your head. If if we allow this part of the state, this county in this state, to go down, and I don't care if you're in Monroe, you know, hey, I live out in this area. This is where the revolution is going to be fought for the state to get things done and turned around on the right course right here in Gwinnett County. There are tons and tons of people, uh, special interests that understand that if they can take this county, um, inject depravity, have lawlessness. And, you know, they always put a pretty window dressing on something to just kind of take your focus off what's really going on. People are coming to Gwinnett in mass numbers because it's a great county to be in. You know, there are so many that have that was here before all of us that helped build and construct this county to make it a place to where the schools were, were great for the kids and everything. It is our turn. It is our job to do the pick and shovel work to keep this county rolling. And we got to we got to tamp down this de depraved behavior and all of this violence and everything that's going on in schools. If we don't back the blue, for, you can forget it. Without law and order, we're going to have chaos. We have a lot of work to do, but we can get it done. We're going to do the hard work. And I, I've told everybody that I bring on this program, I basically tell them, hey, when you, you better bring it when you come on here because people are looking for good leadership. And if that's what you present, and that's what you uphold. You're not going to have any problem with getting any support from the people, at least that we know in the war room. And quite frankly, a lot of citizens that are spread out all over Gwinnett County. All right, let's let's get to another question and uh, we'll move to wrap things up and get we'll give Baron an opportunity to, uh, you know, tell us how to follow him and everything. So let me get to another question from the uh, audience. There was one on the um comment section we'll get to that one here in a second um let me see let's let's move to something national that i heard um today so there are some candidates uh, that are front runners um i think everybody know who this candidate is but he's he's speaking of uh mass deportation um uh, in in the the, the quote unquote scam of birthright citizenship. I guess anchor babies, you get somewhere, you know, have a kid and then now you're part of the country. Um and the death penalty for child trafficking. Um there's a I guess a movie that came out, me and my wife are planning on going to see Sound of Freedom. I can tell you right now my pastor's wife and daughter went to see this movie and they they they, they could not sit through it. I don't think they lasted maybe 15 minutes. They had to get up and walk out of the, the theater. It was so bad. The United States are is the biggest consumer in child trafficking crimes, you know, like um, the sexual abuse and everything. And it's sad to um, to know that um, and, and being a country that's participating in that. Um, what are your thoughts? Mass deportations, you know, the birthright citizenship bringing a hammer down on child tra traffickers and um, people that are running um, rings like that, that are abusing women and um, so forth. What, what, what say you on that? What, what are your thoughts on that whole thing? Well, <clears throat> I, it's it having been overseas, like I said, in a lot of countries where you see these kinds of things are, are rampant, but they're more public. Um, it's here and people just aren't aware of it. And the fact that, um, I mean, th those are the types of things that are first and foremost. I mean, you know, you, you've got to go after the, the, the weakest in society, those that are abusing them. You know, God has a heart for orphans and widows. Why? Because they're the weakest in society. If, if, if kids are out there, which they are, and they're being trafficked and they're, and there's, you know, things that are being facilitated, we should be we should be targeting those, you know, and going after those with an an unbridled vigor as law enforcement at every level. And it's it's disgusting that we're not. And then in some cases that we're 
protecting that. Um, so, you know, I've got, I've got four adopted kids, the thoughts of what could have happened to them, um, it, it, had they been in a different situation is, is, is difficult, you know, to, to work through. Um, as far as anything that facilitates these, uh, you know, those types of activities, as far as, you know, the, the, the border being completely wide open, I mean, it, you can go through the stats, every one of them, and seeing the, you know, how that facilitates, uh, you know, human trafficking, how that facilitates, you know, drug trafficking, the correlation between all these different things. And, and that's, you know, it, it's crazy that the, the, the number one job of our federal government is to protect our borders. And they've com they're completely delinquent in that. I mean, when the federal government was stood up by the states, they didn't have very many enumerated, you know, chores. They were supposed to make treaties, declare war, protect the borders, and you know, a handful of other things. And we've got no borders, and everybody in the country is paying for that. And the the least of the least, which are these kids, are being exploited in heinous ways. And it, it's it's got to stop. It's got to stop. I will do everything in my power to facilitate working with all the law enforcement agencies in, in Gwinnett and across the state to, to, to target. That'll be priority. Priority one is to protect the kids here and to, and to protect other kids or, or to go after the people that are abusing them. I mean, that's, that should be common, you know, a common uh, uh, theme through, through all law enforcement. And it is, yeah, to a large extent, but you know the reality is, you know, put your money where your mouth is. What are yeah. you actually doing versus what is, um, you know, what do you say that you're going to do? So, so, so would, do you think that would be a um, sting operation worthy, just to make sure that that's not hmm. um, on the rise in the county because it it is definitely you know on the rise in the country. Well, it's, we it's, see. you know, Atlanta is a hub. I mean, obviously, it's a huge hub and it's a cross section of a lot of interstates. So you know, we are ground zero of of that industry. And so you know, with all the counties here and the surrounding around the Beltway, everybody should be focused on that. So, yeah, we need to bring our A game and we need to get uh, people on board as a team and figure out, OK, how do we efficiently devastate um, you know, this industry and say, okay, you might do it in a lot of places, but don't do it here in Atlanta because we're going to, we're coming for you uh, until, until you make that a huge, huge priority and you dedicate assets and you start stringing people up, uh, so to speak, you know, <laughs> you put them away or, you know, you, you put them on death row or whatever else, then it's all, it's all lip service. You've got to go after it, you know, wide open and we need to. All right. And, and last, last question. What is your message? What do you say to criminals that believe they can come to Gwinnett County, cause chaos and destabilize our county through their actions? What, what do you say to a criminal that might be looking at well, this? I tell you this, you better pray to God that that I don't become sheriff, because every organization that I've led, I've I have taken bad organizations, average organizations and great organizations and focus them uh, to be high performing, uh, uh, excelling units. And this is going to be no different. And my goal is to make Gwinnett the place to be feared, the, the place criminals do not want to do business. And and I've you know, I can build teams. I can I can get you know everybody on board. I think that there's it takes leadership to, to bring people together, to focus efforts and to to make a, you know, to bring the heat. And I, you've got to have passion. You've got to have the will to fight. You got to have the will to, uh, you know, cause there's going to be people that, you know, get their feathers ruffled because whatever their agendas are, you got to be able to just like, okay, great. You go, you know, say whatever you want. And you just got to be, bring the a game and get everybody else on board. And yeah, you make one at the place not to do business anymore, period. And that, that can be done, but it, it's going to take, an unbelievable amount of effort. And it certainly isn't, you know, that type of effort isn't being seen right now. Um, so like everything, this is a leadership issue. Well, there it is. Um, Baron Grant, Rainhold.
is safe. So right now, Baron, can you tell everyone where to go to uh, make a contribution to your campaign uh, sure. if they feel so compelled? Yep. Um, so right now uh, we've got our website up. It's Baron for Gwinnett, just spelled out B-A-R-O-N-F-O-R Gwinnett. And then our uh, Facebook and our Twitter site is Baron. And then the number four Gwinnett, because obviously Twitter, you got to shorten it. <laughs> so, uh, uh, and on the website, you'll be able to uh, donate. There's this uh, button up there. that says uh, donate or get involved. Or if you have uh, comments uh, or you want to give me ideas or whatever else, um, again, it's easy. Baron for Gwinnett at gmail.com. Um, so, I answer every one of those, or if you fill out the form on the website and hit a comment, then that will come to me too. And so either way, however you want to, or, and if you want to call me, happy to, happy to chat with you. 402-960-6645. That's on the website. I'll answer every call. So uh, happy to, happy to chat. Um, and yeah, I look forward to, um, you know, the rest of the run and getting, getting this uh, county uh, back to where it needs to be and then making it the model to export, uh, especially the sheriff's office to export around the country. And, um, and, uh, you know, that's, that's what I do. I'm going to, I'm, <laughs> I don't stop. I hit the sled and I put the sled into the next County and that's, that's my track record. So we are going to, we are going to write the ship. We're going to put out the flames, write the ship and, you know, and, and execute the way that we should be executing. Sounds good. It's been a pleasure having you on uh, War Room, Gwinnett County. Good luck with the race. It won't be the last time. Uh, we'll have you back on to, um, you know, update everybody um, on everything that's going on with the campaign and everything. Hold on a second. There you have it, folks. Baron for Gwinnett County Sheriff, um, candidate that's running. Make sure you like, share, and subscribe. Stay locked in. <laughs> um, we have a huge fight on our hands for the county. We are going to hold the line and we're going to dominate, dominate right here in Gwinnett County. War Room, Gwinnett County, the people's voice, keeping you informed. War Room, Gwinnett County, the people's voice.